Feminine Roadmappers, welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife and empowers you to live a more vibrant second half. Uh, If you find us on YouTube, please take the time to subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss any of these empowering conversations. If you're finding me on a podcast platform, please remember to subscribe, rate, and share this content with your friends. Today, friends, we are going to be talking about how we can unclutter our lives so that we can create the lives of our dreams. And to help us with that, my guest, Julie Caraccio, is the Chief Possibility Officer, and she has a passion for helping people unclutter their lives. Julie, thank you so much for being on my show today. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Now, I'm interested, Julie, how did you get into this concept and content around clutter? Well, it first started that I got into organizing. I had just moved from Los Angeles to North Carolina and had this crazy job. And I was like, I don't, what am I doing? And so I said, I'm going to start my own business. Well, what can I do? And I'm like, well, I've always helped people organize. So when I started, my business was called Healing Through Organization because I wanted to do something that would make a difference and support people. But then one day I was working with a client and she said, can we just talk? And I was like, sure, you're the client. <laughs> and what that's because I work in, typically in four hour blocks. And we probably spent three hours talking and then bam, we were able to declutter a lot. So I was like, ah, for me, it was more about the declutter. And I saw what an impact that was. And so why I was doing that and running my business, I was also doing a TV show where I interviewed people called Reawaken Your Brilliance. And with all these body, mind, spirit people, I'm like, ah, when it's clutters, everything that's preventing us from creating the life we desire. So I want to look at this holistically. You know, most organizers, ah, they talk about physical clutter have started maybe a little mental, but I'm like, you got clutter in your relationships. You got spiritual, emotional clutter. What Mm. are we going to do to declutter that so you can move forward in your life? Mm. That is so interesting. I was just having a conversation, I think it was yesterday, talking about the idea of how, you know, one thing leads to another leads to another. And Mm -hmm. sometimes the clutter moves around. We might unclutter our homes, but if our minds and, and, and emotions are cluttered, the clutter follows us, doesn't it? Absolutely. A thousand percent. And when you work on the inner, it reflects the outer and vice versa. A good example is you have a messy desk. That's probably creating a cluttered mind. But as you clear your physical desk, you start to have more mental clarity. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. You know, I think for some people, they can't do anything if there's anything that looks like clutter. And there's other people, if there's some clutter, they're okay with it. Yeah, I mean, we found mold in our basement January 1st. And so the basement has had to be redone. I'm about to get my office painted So it's just one of those things in life. And what I'm like, I know it's going to get taken care of, but for a while, it's not as clutter free and organized as I like, but you've just got to roll with it. But the key is, it's not like this all the time. There are circumstances and we know, okay, this is a plan to get it done. It's when, you know, you haven't decluttered in 10, 15, 20 years. And that's Mm. really common. I don't want people like, oh my gosh, that's me. You are not alone. (laughs) Certain spaces tend to get over cluttered too, don't they? Absolutely. Garage, attic, basements, they can be a big woo, right? Because a lot of times I don't know what to do with this. I don't want to make a decision. I'm going to put it in the attic, right? It's like the land of indecisiveness. I You hit on, you hit the nail on the head there. It's that the, the overwhelm of making so many little decisions that I yes. think is also kind of an, it's like a mental clutter when you have to make hundreds of tiny little decisions we get decision fatigue and sometimes things have meaning I suppose on some level and it's hard to let it go because we have some something attached to it do you find that talk about that yes I would love to have you talk about that so what we get confused on and first of all respect your process like my mom died last year And so I finally got a load out of my dad's house. And I was like, I have to go through some of these, her cookbooks, for example, I just want one or two, but I'm like, I know I can't make a decision now. So I brought the box here, but you know, December I'm doing minimal work and it's going to be focused completely on that when it's going to be a good time for me to do that. So I understand my process. I have a plan. I have a date. A lot of times what we do with objects is we place the memories onto that object. Oh, if I let this cookbook go, I'm saying goodbye to my mother. And I know that's not true, but that's where we get tripped up. 
So our memories are in our head. And I also believe in our hearts, right? My mom's still around just in a different form. She's still in my head and my heart. And so I encourage people, remember, you have those memories. They're not on the object. If the object goes away, your memory's not going to. Mm -hmm. I remember when my sister-in-law's mother passed away mm -hmm. and we had to go through everything. And she did get a, one of those storage units yeah for some things and I do remember going through the process with her and her saying she was going to log a lot of the things with a photograph I think that's a great idea but again that can become clutter mm -hmm. you know if you have this if you never go through it never delete it like, you know I've talked it's a process for me I sorted stuff at my dad's house definitely don't want that but then I'm going to bring more I know I'm going to sort later but again I'm on a timetable and I go through everything I own every year I make my husband do it we've downsized twice unexpectedly in the past two years so I keep on top of it that's another thing that's really important you know I mentioned a moment ago so people bring stuff in and bring it in but they never let anything go out mm-hmm mm-hmm and, you know, we, after the pandemic, a lot of people purged their homes mm -hmm. and the places that you could donate started to, to say, we can't take anymore. And that right. created a certain amount of like, oh, no, what do I do <laughs> with right, these right. things? Yeah, I mean, you have like libraries will only take certain books. I'm getting my neighborhood to get a free little library because I think that's something great, you know. I, I was working with a client recently and she got her wedding dress and she's 85. And so I said, well, let me call around and see what I can find. And so the, I thought I'll start with the high school theater because my niece is involved with that. They're like, nope, we didn't use it. And she was super petite and she's like, yeah, not going to happen. So I ended up finding someone that is a costumer and could, is going to take the fabric and create something groovy from it. And that was the best thing. I mean, I think it's a great solution, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you have to get really creative with how you let things go. Now, when I lived in the Raleigh area, there was an awesome reuse store in Durham and you could have a kid's party there. Like if you're super creative, you know, I remember they had these uh, dating myself, but I remember wallpaper books, <laughs> you know, shoot me if I ever tell my husband to put up wallpaper. And I know it's really, it's coming back a lot, but you know, things like that, you can, if, someone's creative can use something with that and so that's a good thing to say to people what resources do we have in town and it can be done you just maybe have to put a little effort into it mm -hmm. I have noticed that some people creative people artistic people are repurposing some things as well mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm huge into being green if you can definitely repurpose it do it I just got a it's fall here I just put on the fall comforter and so I have uh uh one of those plastic containers it's not like a hard shell it's a soft shell but i'm like i'm going to use that for something i always reuse those i love them because you can see what's in the container you just put a sharpie to label it but you know it's instead of going out and buying i try to not to buy plastic containers if i can help it you know there's usually a solution within your home so let's talk about clutter what is the foundation to what you do your philosophy I believe that first that we all have the answers within. I only see my job as supporting people to bring that out and that our clutter prevents us from creating the life that we desire. So again, it's on multiple fronts. I want people to not get discouraged, but if you aren't in 100% joy all the time, what's going on? What is it we need to do? What if we lived in a world where everyone was doing what they love? Do you think we'd have wars? I'm guessing not. You think we'd be nicer to each other? I'm guessing probably so. That is my ultimate goal to create that, where everyone's doing what they love and live in a society that's happy and joyful. What are some examples, Julie, of a way that someone has physically decluttered, but then had that growth, that expression of expansion in their outer world? Great question. So I once had a client that, um, Oh, this is a good example. So she had, I went to see her and she had this big stack. It was probably three feet high. And I was like, what's this? How long have we had it? And she's like several years. So as we started to talk, there were clippings to send to people, right? Because she said, oh, you know, I thought of you and send this. And so as we talked further, I said, well, why? And then she said, ah, oh, I'm afraid if I don't 
keep in touch with people and send them clippings and send them articles that they won't love me anymore. And as soon as she was able to express that, she knew that it wasn't true. So that went in the recycling bin and her heart opened, you know, she expanded that and enriched her relationships. And you might think that's a great example to me because that's something little simple, but had a huge impact. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. I think we do a lot of things unconsciously. The belief is driving us without us even knowing. Absolutely. Like here's, I want people to look at what they collect. Now I'm not a minimalist. I have, you know, my mother was a painter. So I have a lot of her painters. When I travel, I like to get painting street art and all that. So I'm not about being austere and not having anything. Cause that's not how I roll. But what I'm going to encourage people to do is look, if you have collections. So for a while I was lived in Los Angeles and I was a victim of a violent crime. And as a result of that, I unconsciously started to collect angels. And then I read this book on feng shui and they're like, what you collect represents what you think you're missing from your life. So for me, angels meant love and protection. I'll never forget. I saw this angel. I put it outside my door, right? Cause that angel was going to protect me mm -hmm. if I put her there. So once I realized that I'm like, I don't need to buy angels anymore. And I love angels. So I still have an angel in every room, but I didn't have this need to collect it. So if people are collecting things, ask yourself that and see if you can dig a little deeper. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. And I think there's comfort sometimes, isn't there, in that Absolutely. thing that we love? Absolutely. And, you know, again, I'm, it's not about minimalism, but if you collect angels, if you collect baseball cards, if you collect beer steins and shot glasses and books, you know, it's just too much. It's just can become overwhelming. And it also can serve as a distraction, you know, like, oh, I want to write that great American novel, but I'm going to have to deal with this. I'm going to get distracted by all the physical clutter I have or emotional or whatever it is. It can, you know, serve as a way to protect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because I think at some point when people are collecting something, it becomes, this might be a strong word, but almost obsessive. Like you, let's say you collect refrigerator magnets when you travel now That's you a good can't one. Not, a lot of people do that yeah, yeah you can't not buy the magnet right because you've always done it right exactly but that's a just because yes and i like to say examine your just becauses just because you've always done something doesn't mean that you have to continue and you know we're coming upon the holidays and talk about the just becauses <laughs> traditions and bumping up against that that can be really challenging for people mm -hmm. so i'm gonna encourage you this holiday season what are you doing just because you always have and how are you gonna let that go and fill it with something you really desire to do that's that's an interesting point isn't it just because you've always done it there may be something that brings more joy there may be something that brings more um, community or more peace, peace or yes. whatever in, in that decision as opposed to, because if we're doing something out of obligation, wouldn't that be emotional clutter on some level? A thousand percent. Right. Where are we doing something out of guilt or obligation? A great thing happened to me yesterday. Uh, so we just moved back to my hometown i've started playing tennis and i was like oh I'll volunteer and help out and he said i'll confirm the night before and he didn't and a couple of hours he was like hey can you come out and i volunteered the week before and they sent me home blah 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 and in the past i would have been like oh but you said you'd volunteer it didn't matter if they didn't follow up and i'd feel guilt and obligation i just was like sorry i'm going out of town next week i've already filled your slot and he's like, it's okay. And he was really great about it. I just wanted to check in. And there wasn't because I know if I would have gone, I would have been angry and I would have been frustrated. And let's talk about this, bring this into relationship clutter. My, I play tennis a couple nights a week, got my first, uh, st uh, what do you call it? Crock pot meal going today. But I'm like, I don't want to be another meal late for my husband. He's already twice this week going to have to fend for himself with something I cooked. So I was like, that's another layer to it. So I felt no guilt. I just, sorry, I'm unavailable. And I try not to say sorry a lot. I'm being aware, more aware of that, but yeah. you know, because you didn't ask me, it's too late now, instead of bending over backwards and doing something out of obligation. Mm. As women, that obligation is such a big mm -hmm. challenge, isn't it? We have 
we have that kind of obligation clutter. Like we don't know how to set boundaries sometimes. I'm not saying nobody does, but I think we struggle to set oh. those boundaries, don't we? A thousand percent. And women tend to be the nurturers, the caregivers. So it's our our job. I'm putting that for quote for people <laughs> on the podcast to take care of everyone and make sure they're happy. No. And you know what? You model good behavior when you have good boundaries. So you teach your kids that, that it's all right to say no. I think we've also gotten confused when you say no, that it's being mean or that it's coming from anger. Absolutely not. You can lovingly say no. Hey, can't do it. Have a great tennis match. I know you all will. And it doesn't have to be harsh or whatever. And I think that sometimes gets mixed into it underneath that story that you told is that confidence that the decision that we're making is the best for us and our family and I find most of the time that if you're confident in your decision if they understand that you know yourself and that you're just making a statement. Most people aren't unhappy about it. It's very rare that people get upset. They, they, they tend to respect it if you're sure of yourself and you make that statement strong, but you do it like you said, not in a, we don't have to be angry or mean. We can just right. state our truth. It's interesting because it doesn't always create a negative response. It's just our comfort level with that. I would say it's part of our emotional clutter. Somewhere in our past, Mm -hmm. We've learned that this is how we, quote, do it in order to be a, quote, good woman, right? Be the good girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love there's also energetic clutter. And you brought up a mm. great example, because when I come from my truth and just say it with a boundary, everyone, I've always had positive responses. But I want people to be aware of how they say something, because there's a difference. I'm unable to do that for you. And you can tell them waffling. I'm unable to do that. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. And from, you know, so what are, be aware of the energy behind your words and how you're mm. saying things. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> and I think sometimes maybe when we're dealing with any kind of clutter, whether it's that feeling of I've always done it this way. So there's that clutter of, I have no choice or we you know, always have a choice. I want to emphasize that and doing nothing is a choice. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. yeah. But there is a, I think for for us as women, there is a give yourself some space sometimes. Maybe don't answer right away. That, Like you said, you know you need to go through your mom's cookbooks, but you've given yourself the space you know you need yep. until you get to that task. And I think sometimes we could have a buffer in our life to say, you know, if somebody asks us to do something we've always done with the quotation marks again, we have the opportunity to say, you know what? Um, let me get back to you on that. And that's perfect, right? And that gives you the time to think about it, ask yourself, check in, do I really want to do that? And if you don't, okay, I'm confident in this decision and that's going to be shown. Absolutely, absolutely can take the time you need to say that. And I think that's smart because so many times we do things knee jerk, right? We're on autopilot. So we just don't think it through. Like my automatic response would have been like, Sure, I'd be happy to. And then I'd be scrambling around, blah, but take a deep <laughs> breath. If you need to take a night, a week, whatever it is, give yourself that time. Mm -hmm. Now, Julie, I was curious if you've been able to identify, and I'm sure you have on some level, what are some basic, I would say, causes or underlying uh, things that contribute to the tendency toward clutter? Great question. It can be you know, really everything's individual, but yes. it could be a fear of success. It could be a fear of failure. You know, if you grew up in a chaotic household, then clutter is your comfort. If you take away the clutter, then, oh, that's uncomfortable. It can be a way of protection. I'll tell this story. So before I officially started, uh, I was living in Los Angeles and my friends are like, you're uptight. Come at me. It's before I even did this. Come up and get organized. You're really uptight. So I went to my friend's house and I was like, this is really weird. I'm like, you're organized except for one wall. It was really bizarre. Like she had a, an apartment. So you did a long living room wall that, you know, took up several rooms. And as we talked, she had a crazy neighbor who, I mean, was just a nut job. And I was like, 
you're trying to get this you're putting up a block for this guy and it's understandable that you do that but it was like that little moment like i'm trying to protect myself from this nut job and so i'm gonna put up this literal clutter wall so you'd be amazed at the little things like that that pop up and then you said to she's like oh my gosh you're right i was like let's learn how to deal with this guy in a different way and take care of this now but it might be for protection i also believe if you boil it down it's from feeling not good enough not worthy or loved right we're either coming from love or we're coming from fear how many signs and signals especially i'm so thankful that you do this podcast for older women because you know it was like a when i turned 50 uh like i the chains came off like i don't care I and mean, it doesn't mean <laughs> i don't care about what's important i don't care you don't like me okay you know thank you next however the lady sings and that's i'm not you're intimidated by me because i'm awesome okay i hope you can figure it out you want to gossip about women thank you next you know and it's like i don't care and it was so freeing to me and but women i just get excited like i want to see women our age come into our fullness come into our own you know i started my business at 40 i published my first book at 50 it is never too late to do anything and and I hope that women take away that message from your podcast in this episode, 40 business, 50 books. I'm still going. You can do it at any age. Sometimes I think we can do it better after 50 because we have experienced so much and we have gained mm -hmm. garnered skills and knowledge mm -hmm. and insight into ourselves and the world around us that we're actually, um, we're loaded to launch something amazing. We definitely are. And, you know, and, but we're bombarded by those. If I don't look like this at 50 or all this Photoshop, I was looking at someone, I'm like, you're my age. No way. You don't have wrinkles. You're skinnier than I am. And so you're going to naturally more naturally have wrinkles. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, I love Jamie Lee Curtis. Who's like, here's me here. It is on Photoshop because we, and we need to rise up against those fake standards. Cause they, when we get obsessed with stuff like that, and I'm, I'm not saying, don't do your routines, but that's taking time and effort and energy away from your passion or something else that you could be doing. Energy, where we're putting our energy, where does clutter affect and how does clutter affect our energy, Julie? Clutter is literally stuck stagnant energy. Mm. So you walk in a room with physical clutter, you're going to lack mental clarity you know, I want people to think of the big, bigger picture, like a messy desk isn't just a cluttered desk. It could be a roadblock to promotion. A closet that's overstuffed with clothes might prevent a relationship from flourishing. And so think in bigger and broader term. So it's literally, if you were to go and this would be a great little exercise to do. I'm sure there's an area or space. Go into that space that's cluttered, you know, might be at work, might be at home, like your garage or something. That's easy for a lot of people. How do you feel? Close your eyes, take a couple deep breaths. How do you feel? And then go into a space that's cleared. Same thing. Close your eyes. Notice how you feel because everything's energy, whether you believe that from a physics perspective or a spiritual perspective like I do. So what are we putting out to the universe? What are we doing? And so when we feel blocked, that's what clutter is. Mm. I'm wondering if the layers to this are pretty powerful for people as you're working through it with them. Oh, a thousand percent. It's like those examples that I've mentioned. Oh, I know people love me. I don't need to send a recipe to them. Oh, I didn't realize my marriage was in trouble. But once we cleared the dining room clutter and we're able to sit down and connect at mealtime, what a huge difference that made. Uh, my mother-in-law is not nagging me anymore and we can work on our relationship to be healthier. Absolutely. And, you know, everything I spend my life trying to be the best version of me, there are layers mm -hmm. to that. I stop, I get, fall down, I get back up. But a great example is feeling like a victim. I'll never forget. I was in my thirties and my brother said to me, you see yourself as a victim. And I'm like, it's amazing someone who doesn't do personal growth can have these great insights, but he was a thousand percent right. And I could hear him at the time. Oh, hmm, that feels really, well, what does that mean? And so that started me on a really great spiritual journey. And 
the layers now of feeling like a victim are much more subtle. So I have to pay attention. I have to, oh, oh, you're starting to feel like a victim. Oh, okay. All right. Let's bring it back to me. What do we need to heal? What action do we need to take so I don't feel like a victim? Mm -hmm. So it's always layers to that. And and we also have to have joy and have to have fun. I'm not about having to declutter 24-7. You know, do some, take a break. But are you doing it on a consistent level. You know, it's not just the physical stuff. It's health clutter. Are you going to get your yearly exam to make sure that you're healthy and, you know, and have a doctor that honors your intuition. I said to my doctor a couple of years ago, I'm like, can I have my thyroid scan? And she was like, sure. I just said, it's an intuitive feeling. Well, how did growth I ended up having to have it half of it removed, but she honored my intuition. Didn't like, I've been with doctors who have been like, no, you're no. And so that's to me, removing that clutter because that allows you someone who honors your intuition and your relationship. Are you hanging out with people that love and support you that say, yes, you can do it. Or here's all the reasons you can't. Mm. Yeah. That's where it gets ticky tacky, right? How do we declutter our relationships? Having boundaries, you know, sometimes you have to let friendships fade. I was always like, oh, you have to be friends forever. And that's absolutely changed for me. Sometimes you'll be with people for a season or a reason they come into your life. Some are lifelong friends and, you know, others aren't. And that's not right or wrong. But it's very important that you have people around you who love and support you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can have honest conversation. Like I had a friend and I was like, you kvetch all the time. I said, I can't hang with this. And I said, I'm your friend and I love you dearly. But you need to either talk to a therapist, kvetch to someone else. I can't deal with it 24-7. And he respected it. And we didn't talk for a while, which was okay. But we're still friends. We're back to boundaries again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, I want you to remember, we, are, we have our boundaries, but also that energetic component of boundaries. Like I took a, when I lived in Los Angeles, I took a great self-defense course and there's a difference. So one of the first things, and I had to use it, I was coming in Los Angeles one day and someone approached me, said, oh, I just let out of the twin towers, which is the big County jail down there. And they, what we were taught is put your hands up like that. And so if I would have been like, stop, stop, what do you want? Right. So not only my physically portraying that I'm energetically doing that and setting a boundary because I want people to think about when someone's crossed your boundaries lately, you said, no, or I don't want to do that. And they kept pushing and moving your boundary back because you weren't solid in it. Because mm -hmm. they sense that people who are manipulative. They want you to do what they need you to do. But then they'll push that a little bit, push that until, and if you're not strong in it, they're going to continue. That is so true. Oh my goodness. Yes. The way that we show up in the world dictates a lot of what we get back from the world, doesn't it? What you put out, you get back. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about um, physical clutter and people are so used to what they have, and like you said, the chaos, that's a comfort mm -hmm. if you're used to chaos. And when I was a newlywed, um, I found that the chaos that I was used to, I married someone who was very non-confrontational, gentle. Mm -hmm. So fighting wasn't an option. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So I, I found that the way that I dealt with the, the abrupt change from one kind of environment to another or one kind of relationship to another mm -hmm. was to constantly rearrange my furniture. Like every mm. few months I would rearrange my furniture and it took me a while to get to that place where I realized why I had trouble relaxing. Yeah. And I can see, I, I'm just processing your comment about clutter being a, a chaotic comfort because K, I don't have clutter everywhere, but I'm married to someone who was raised in a chaotic environment um, emotionally mm -hmm. and and um was lots and lots of clutter mm -hmm. and um my brother-in-law married somebody whose mom collected a lot of things and his wife collects a lot of things so i feel like the comfort level with 
And it's just an observation, not a judgment, but absolutely it's, it's interesting because I can see in my life that correlation, Mm -hmm. my own life, as well as like in a marriage, you have different levels of comfort Mm -hmm. with clutter or cleanliness. Mm -hmm. And there is comfort to a certain amount of clutter. I can see that. Now, would you say to someone who a little bit of clutter makes them feel okay, that how do you, where do you draw the line? Would you say in your experience, people shouldn't have clutter at all, or is a certain level of clutter okay? You know, where, where have you found the most optimal um, level of clutter or lack of clutter to be supportive or does it change from person to person? That's a great question. It's definitely person to person. So what I would say, I always ask a couple of questions like, what do you feel comfortable in? Can you find what you need? Do you feel at peace when you walk in the door? Mm-hmm. And I'm okay. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, like, I, and I'm not talking about hoarders. You need, you know, that's a whole right. different ball of wax. We're talking like normal logic. here. We're talking normal here. <laughs> but, you know, and then you also have to bring in the other parent, the other person or the family member. And you just, And another thing I'll say, like, If someone were to just say, hey, I'm in town, I want to drop by, do you need to be ready in five minutes for that person? Or you're like, I can spend an hour tidying up. You know, it's about progress. It's not about perfection. So the big thing for me is, can you find what you need? Do you feel peace in your environment? Is it causing problems within the family unit? You know, those are the things Mm -hmm. to look at. Like, here's an example. If you have someone I found in a lot of marriages, not all that one leans one way and one leans the other way. And so sometimes I have to say to the organized one, you know what, you got to lower your standard. So I just did this the other day. So someone likes to read. And so it drove the other one. They're all there on the nightstand, my clothes, all my books and drive me crazy. <laughs> I'm like, well, then let's get a little basket that they can keep all the book. I'm a book reader. So I'm like, I right, let's get a little basket. It's not going to be super neat, but everything's going to be contained in that basket. Mm-hmm. And it can't be alphabetized. It can't be super neat all the time. <laughs> you have to let go and just, right. it's all in a basket now. Okay. So we can deal with this. We've improved it. It can't all be about your standards. You know, there have to be give and take there. That's such, that's such wise advice because I remember uh, years ago, I knew someone whose husband, literally you couldn't leave anything out. So she couldn't find anything. So if she set a pen down or a cup, it would immediately get put away. And then she had no idea where it was. Uh, you know, I once went out on a date We'd gone out on a couple of dates and we went back to his place and I looked at his closet and I said, I, I can't date this guy anymore. It was so organized by like color and the hangers were in perfectly apart. Like, I wow. Could, and I was like, yeah, no, I did. And bless his heart. He was a nice, nice man. But I was like, no, I, I saw that. And that's all I needed to know. I'm like, this isn't going to be a fit for me. I, I don't want that. If I had my pen or my cup, I'd, I couldn't live with that. I would go insane. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a place for your stuff, girl. That's fantastic. If it's like, we've lived in this house for 23 years. Where I decided at the beginning that these things would be, that is exactly where they still are. That doesn't mean that we don't have clutter. Like our dinner table is just the landing spot. And every week or two, I got to kind of do this. <laughs> right, right, right. Go through the stuff. And like back to the point of my husband and his upbringing, um, we believed his mom had Asperger's. And ah. stuff and clutter and mess was when we moved, when her, when his father died and we moved her into a new apartment, got her new furniture, got her set up. It wasn't long before it was messy again. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because mm-hmm. for her world, That's we couldn't keep her. Yeah. yeah, We couldn't keep her out of the clutter, the mess, and that sort of a thing. So when you're raised with that, like laundry on the furniture all the time, even when people come over and, you know, right. just it's, it's kind of like, and if I may approach this subject, almost like a marriage conversation. Sometimes, like you said, you know, you have to accept to some degree where someone is comfortable Mm -hmm. because otherwise you're just going to fight about it 
And since I'm comfortable with clutter on some level, it's not a huge deal, but I do find myself, there's like a clutter level. Do you find that Mm -hmm. people have this? It's like up to this point, I'm good. Yes. But after a while I get like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Why, why is everything being piled in this one spot? I feel like this is a common problem. I'm not the only one. Oh, you are. And the dining room table is, especially if people have like a kitchen table, maybe in a duff, more formal dining room that usually gets the where it's more formal usually get becomes a landing place. And, but that goes back to making decisions, right? Yes, it oh, does. I just have to file this, right? But I don't want to mentally, I can't handle it today. I don't want to file it. You know, if you can clean it off weekly, that'd be great. Like I was yeah. like, you spend five minutes a day tidying your desk. If you can't do that, then of the week tidy your desk and again Mm -hmm. like you have to be gentle with yourself like i mentioned my office is going to get painted shortly so it's a little bit of chaos because i've got piles because i'm going to have to move everything to the center and my husband just said to me today you need to do more so that it's not at the last minute i was like yeah i know but we're going away and i have the cats that are coming and i'm trying to like keep it somewhat organized with piles so but i know it'll be taken care of right so just that that's a big thing and to give yourself a deadline right because when you say someday ah i'm gonna someday someday never comes right Right. it's very convenient we can keep pushing that back Mm -hmm. now you talked about creating the life you desire how clutter impacts that let's talk a little bit about that philosophy that idea that clutter is negatively impacting the life that you desire let's talk a little bit clutter is what's not important so if you are spending time, it's like ta- we talked about boundaries and saying no. If you say, yes, I'll be the Girl Scout chief leader and yes, I'll do carpool and you really want to work on your art, what you love and your passions art and you would like to be an artist full time, you keep saying no to that. You keep saying no to the trivial stuff, the stuff that then I'm not saying that being a Girl Scout leader is not trivial. My point is. You know, if you're always saying yes to something, you're saying no to something to yourself. And so being aware about that. And again, like I've mentioned relationships, like who, yeah, man, you can be an artist. My mom started painting when she was in her fifties. It's awesome. She's an amazing painter. Right. And I was like, and she was like, you know, you're the only one encouraging me. And I'm like, I'm, you call me anytime you feel doubt, I'm going to encourage you. So and having those relationships that do that. And when we spend time on the insignificant stuff, again, like it might, it's a distraction. Well, what am I trying to distract myself from? You know, I was talking about someone, um, I, we moved back to my hometown, which is my dad says good things about being from a small town or the bad things about being from a small town and <laughs> someone I'm really annoyed with. And I was talking to someone about it. And I said, ah, it's distracting me. Cause when I think about this dumb, dumb, I'm focusing on that instead of the other things. Like I got to finish a book. If, but if I'm thinking about this bozo, then I can't be focusing on the book, right? And so why do we need a distraction? I always tell people, look at yourself as an archaeologist. How can I dig deeper to find out what it's really about? Now, there are some people who can say, ah, I don't need to know what it's about and just move forward. Most of us aren't like that. So if we understand the why behind it, oh, that's why I do. That. Oh, okay. Now that I understand that, I can let it go and move forward. You know, I do end of life planning and organizing because talk Uh, about the ultimate letting go death is right it's all coming to us and especially i'd say in america we have i you know my personal theory is plastic surgery is there's an element of fear of death mixed into that because if i make myself look younger then i don't have to acknowledge i'm aging and that doesn't mean i'm going to die someday so there's this great fear around death and to me that's the ultimate letting go because really when we clear our clutter we're letting go Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, as you talk, identifying patterns in our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The patterns point to something, don't they? Absolutely do. Absolutely Mm -hmm. do. If we find ourselves in the same kinds of restrictive relationships or the same kind of oppressive jobs or the same kind of um, ruts in our life, you know, because until where... you break through that, you're going to call into your life the exact same thing until you've learned that lesson. It's not a mistake. <laughs> we've learned a lesson, but we've got to break through that to get to the next level and to move forward. Mm-hmm. And what I encourage people, make it about yourself. It's like I'm annoyed with that bozo. Okay, he's a bozo. 
but what is it about you that needs healing? Mm. Why are you upset about this? What in you still needs to be healed? Because when we're neutral, I was working with a client the other day and uh, she was telling me about growing up really poorly. And I mean, having rats in the apartment and uh, something happened. And I said, when you can get to the point, you're like, oh, there's a rat and are neutral about it then that your association with your childhood and being poor and all that, then you'll know it's gone. When you're just like, Oh, I'm talking about corn on the cob, talking about a rat, the same thing. Because when you get that charge, when you're angry and you're upset. Yes. And, and it's just saying, Hey, I'm here to be healed. I'm ready to, Hey, this is a good thing. I'm coming up because I'm ready to be healed. So let's do this. Right. But now we have trigger warnings have to say content warnings and all that. And to me, that's, not a healthy thing because if you get upset that's again look at it as hey something's ready to be healed it's coming up to get out and to be released and let go of but if we always like oh oh, oh oh and i can guarantee you if you put yourself in a bubble and someone says trigger warning content warning and you do that you go out to get the mail the dogs of the neighbor is going to trigger whatever it is it will find you you cannot escape it <laughs> you know it's funny that you say that because I've done a lot of work as well around some pretty deep stuff and the idea of triggers. It's interesting thinking about clutter and triggers in the same conversation. How do clutters and triggers relate? It's a really good question. I've never been asked that before. I think clutter can definitely, it's. Is it a protection hmm. against triggers? Is it like I an think insulation? It can be. I think it can be for, for some people. I don't think it's a one size fit all ever. Mm -hmm. And so for some people it can be, but let's talk about emotional clutter. Mm -hmm. It's like when people are, have road rage, it's not about the car that cut them off. They're pissed off about a lot of stuff. And so what's the anger about? Is it because you can't express yourself or someone always crosses your boundary and gosh, darn it. They just did it again with the car, but this time I'm going to do something and stand up for myself because we can't mm. hide from it. Our emotions will come out usually at the most inopportune time right. if we don't respond to it and we don't heal it. Mm. I love that. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I work with people as a coach and I help mm. them navigate these beliefs and these stories that we tell ourselves that are holding yeah. them back. And when I worked through, uh, anger was one of the things I needed to work through. Having grown up in an environment where there was mm -hmm. some abuse, a lot of mm -hmm. anger, I was obedient and quiet until I hit a certain age. And then it was like the lid came off and I was yeah. a bit unhinged for a while, yeah, you yeah. know, because I didn't know how to deal with my anger. But it is interesting that you talk about that deflection of the emotion onto something else and I feel like that's what clutter is if mm -hmm. if I could draw the analogy it's like if I have an emotional state I can deflect that demo emotional state off with stuff Absolutely. so there's that emotional clutter that's creating the physical clutter it is or with emotional eating I'm mm -hmm. with you like you always the women's to be quiet you know you don't express this yada 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 and so for a long time, and it's something I constantly have to be aware of, oh, I'm upset instead of getting a pint of ice cream to eat. What is it they're upset? And I just talked to someone the other day and I've been talking to women about this. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so true for me. And she said, when you want the chip and the crunch, that's anger. And when you're eating the sweets, it's to soothe you. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that rings true for me. And see, again, that's another thing I didn't know, another layer to it, another, aha, like, make sure you're aware of this <laughs> we have to be so diligent <laughs> right right yeah you do but i find that you know the diligence does pay off and i think there's a gentleness and a grace that this process requires because like you said it's absolutely, emotional absolutely. it's physical mm -hmm. it's spiritual it's mental it's you know it's layered nothing like my cluttered house, if you will, if I have a really, let's say my house was crazy cluttered. That's an attachment to something else. It's not, our lives aren't in compartments. Everything exactly. is interwoven, mm -hmm. right? Right. So you, absolutely. So you need to be gentle with yourself. You congratulate yourself for taking that first step. You congratulate yourself for the first thing that you let go of and be gentle and understand it's a process. 
You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. If you have a decluttered house, it's not going to go away. If you suffered abuse as a child, you know, you're just not going to snap your fingers or after one therapy session automatically be healed and whole. It just doesn't, you know, I know Eckhart Tolle had a night of whatever, whatever, but my brain would probably explode if something like that happened to me. So just I don't think it's common. Right. It is not common. It's more often the rest of us who are like, okay, my journey. And, you know, I used to think that there was some end that I was to reach. Right. And what I've learned is it's, it's about the journey. It's about continuing with it. There, I'm never going to be done. Right. Mm -hmm. There's always a way to be better myself. I'm not going to reach guru status. And so I just continue to do the best that I can each and every time. And when I fall down, I get back up and I say, it's okay. It's okay. You ate a bag of chips today. I know you're upset. I know it would have it would have been great if we could have stopped after a couple chips. We didn't. Okay, I still love you. It's okay. And I think a word that popped into my mind, Julie, is expectations. Mm, yes, great Those. expectations, and we have these. I need to be perfect. I need to do this. You know, what if your expectation is you just do the best you can today? Mm -hmm. Well. Believe it or not, we are already toward the end of our time together. That just flew by. <laughs> so, Julie, I would love to have you anchor in for us three things that people can kind of begin with that you can encourage them in this cluttered conversation. What would those three things be? One, commit to 10 minutes a day, whether it's looking at your emotional cl uh, clutter or clearing some physical clutter because 10 minutes a day adds up to over 60 <clears throat> hours in a year and you can accomplish a lot. That's a week and a half of work, your work day. You can accomplish a lot in that. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, I know what I want to end with. The second thing I would say, first, spend 10 minutes a day. Uh, second, respect your process and how you need to do things. A lot of times people get tripped up because I can't hold something and ask if it brings joy. And that doesn't take away from people who can do that. But that's not my process. So honor and respect your process and just keep with it every day. And then finally know that you're good enough, loved and worthy, no matter what. I don't care what you've done. You're good enough, loved and worthy, no matter what. Mm. Those are powerful. So powerful. And, and honoring our journey, Julie, is such a such an important thing, even when we're dealing with stuff, yeah. right? Sometimes we yes. can minimize the stuff, but the stuff means something somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. what you're saying is the clutter is pointing to something. It's not the thing itself. Yes. It's the, it's, it's the embodiment signal. of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like signaling on the path. Okay. This is something that needs to be healed. This is something that needs to be changed. This is something I need to delete. I need to add something. Yeah. 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 So powerful. How can people find you, Julie? If they go to reawakenyourbrilliance.com, they can learn more about me. All my books are there, my classes, my podcast, all the good stuff. Fantastic. Well, Julie, I want to thank you so very much for saying yes to me and for being on the show and for really being a part of someone's process, because I believe that what you share leads to freedom. It's a path to freedom from those things that keep us in bondage, the emotional, physical, mental, spiritual clutter that we carry. And you're that ripple that comes into their life. And, and I really appreciate the way that you presented this conversation and how gracious and kind you are. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks for being such a resource for women. It is my pleasure. Absolutely. So now, Julie, you also have a podcast. What is it called and where can it be found? It's called Clear Your Clutter Inside and Out. It can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts. And it's also on YouTube. And I forgot to mention, if they go to my website, reawakenyourbrilliance.com, I have a free clutter assessment. It's going to help you figure out your clutter priority and a take action item to get started. Fantastic. All right, friends. You've got your marching orders. If you head on over to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 288, you will find this resource that Julia has offered. If you find us on YouTube, just look down below in the description. I will have the links there as well. Please don't forget to subscribe. 
and set reminders so that you don't miss these powerful conversations. Today, we've been talking about how clutter is a way of blocking yourself from becoming the best version of yourself, of having the life of your dreams. And we all have that clutter. So remember that piece that Julie shared, that we need to be gracious and gentle with ourselves in the process. 10 minutes a day, even if you start with 10 minutes a week, recognize that you are in where you are where you are in life with the knowledge and the skills that you have. And we know a lot is going on, but you have so much power in your knowledge, in your wisdom, in your years. Let's let go of those things that are holding us back so that we can launch forward with all of this wisdom and power that we have as women of a quote certain age. So thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Please leave your comments below. Let Julie know how her nuggets of wisdom have helped you to move forward in your life. And of course, please remember to join us each week here on Feminine Roadmap Podcast so you can gain more and more information to empower you to live the life of your dreams. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.